Hi everyone, and welcome to this talk on technologies for an improved quality of life. This talk is hosted by the IMAC e and has been arranged by the South Lancashire Young Members Panel. I'm Ian Taylor, I chair the panel, and I'll be hosting and moderating your questions for the talk. Joining us is our speaker, Matt, Dr. Matthew Dickinson, a senior lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire. Matt specializes in computer-aided engineering and also takes part in several research groups at the university. He recently became the sub-chair of the F48 Committee for Exoskeletons with the American Standards for Testing for Materials, also known as ASTM for short, and in his spare time likes to build robots and enjoys myth-busting comic book characters. Over to you, Matt. Hi, thanks, Ian. Um, yes, just to follow up on Ian's comments, my name's uh, Dr. Matt Dickinson. I work at the University of Central Lancashire. And uh, this talk is a little bit of the first initial stages of where a project, which I'll be honest, never imagined for a second this would take us the way that it did. Um, to give you a little brief intro to me, my initial background, my PhD, was originally in tribology, looking at piston ring technologies. Then I ended up um, being involved in this project in a whole new area, which, to be honest, I never even thought for a second I ever would. Um, but what I really want to do today is just show you all about um, where this technology is going and really about the so-called uh, healthy aging. Now, um, this is a topic, is, is a very interesting one, but let's, let's, let's move on and I'll give you a bit of an introduction to what we're going to be talking about. So the contents, uh, what I want to do is actually talk to you all about the challenges and what it is not. Now, what I mean by that is there's a very, very strong mis misunderstanding about what the uh, governmental strategy about healthy aging actually is. What I want to do is grab your attentions to make you realize that what it actually is, is it's, it's an incredibly complicated design problem and something where that is not one size would fit all, in a lack of better words. Then what I want to do is just open up some of the possible solutions that have been noted in many of the different organizations about the um, Healthy Aging Governmental Strategy. Then what, I, what I'd like to do is we're going to discuss a little bit about exoskeleton technology and I'm going to introduce you to our first initial stage project, our first exoskeleton project. Uh, you must forgive me, I've just noticed I've missed a tab off. So we're going to discuss the first study that we've done, which we've now published. And then we're going to discuss also the second study, which is actually not on that tab list. So massive, massive apologies with that. Then we're going to close with some conclusions, um, discuss the key people who have been collaborating with us on this project. Some of the people out there that have been supporting on, us on this and helping us with um, initial stages and progression is phenomenal. And finally, I'm going to introduce you to the team. So, <clears throat> challenges, what they are not. So, this is, this is quite a famous image, by the way. This can be found uh, pretty much all over. My, uh, I put a reference to it just in case you wanted to actually see where this was coming from. What this is discussing is the population growth. Now, I won't lie, a year... Oh, maybe two years ago, um, I'd, I'd initially seen this and I thought, okay, population grows. And I won't lie in my perspective, I became quite naive to it. I kind of sat there and thought, well, so, so what? What does that matter? I'd never really thought about the bigger implications that this actually has on, on our community, on our world, on, on the economies that, that we actually have. So, what is suggesting that uh, uh, by 2050, that we could be looking at a uh, 30% or more population, uh, an overall population growth that will be at the ages of 60 or older. This is a large level of population. And again, even when I first initially heard this, I sat and thought, well, how does that really affect? Um, how does that affect a lot of things? So what I'm gonna do is break that down into these challenges a little bit further. So when we consider this, and the implications of our population, what does it actually mean? When we think of this, what type of impact will it have on the economy? So when we consider the economy, the, um, the Center for Aging Better, they have suggested that um, one million people the age of 50 
in present labour market have actually been in a position where they've had to leave work um, involuntary. Now, they've put it down to they've had to leave work through uh, health reasons. Now, I, I understand what a few of you will be thinking. Well, health reasons can be a, an old spectrum of different er elements, which is very true. So this is why instantly you kind of sit and think, well, one size won't fit all in this, in this example. So what we're in, we, we're in a position where if this is happening, not, not if, that the fact of this, this happening, that people at that age are forced into that position, they're going to be, um, there's going to be more of a tax, there's going to be more of an implication on our uh, present economies all over the world. And it's purely because um, the, the labor market themselves, they've had to leave just through to, to, to health reasons. If you consider the healthcare factor of what it is that we're doing with healthcare. Now what, again, the Center for Aging Better have, have discussed is that at present it is estimated that men at the age of 65 can expect uh, again, this is an average, can expect uh, 19 years or plus of uh, a, a 19 year extension to their life, I should say. Um, but this, doesn't, this does only mean that 10% of them men will be expecting a good, healthy life. If you consider this with women, um, from the ages of 65, they can be expecting 21 years on average of their life and only 11% of them will be of good health. This is a huge issue. You've got to remember that if these people are expecting to be of good health, it means only 10 and 11% will live just normal productive lives and the rest will be under some type of healthcare and some type of health support. Um, but when you consider this, of that, if you're looking at this level of population who have some type of ailment, so this can be from mental health through to uh, um, in inability of being uh, mobile or anything like that, um, you've got to consider that the social aspect of what this will have on their lives, the socialization of these people on their lives, it becomes very restricted. So this then, become, this then can hinder their health even greater to the amount. So when we consider social, it is, it is estimated that at, uh, over the next 15 years, the uh, healthcare will need to spread 3.3% and inter intermittently over the 15 years and then spreading a further 3.9% every year. And what this is in, in essence saying that this will need to stretch further to actually be able to support. Now, this is what, this when I first saw some of these Statistics. This is what really rained home for me. What this is actually talking about is <laughs> this is actually not talking about the present aged population. This is trying to reflect on the idea of that anybody who's within their 20s at the moment, they will fall into this. So this then suggests that what we need to do is act now to try and find solutions. Right. So when we're discussing this, Trying to tackle this problem, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and I do use that term quite openly, quite a bit, because it can easily be seen of, well, simply do this. So, one possible solution is to invest in hospitals, support systems. Now, um, COVID has really dragged this out quite a bit, of that when we're into quite a high numbers needed to be in hospital, the support mechanisms there are, are difficult for hospitals to keep up with. Some of the doctors and nurses, as we all well know, they have been given 100% into making sure that they can support everybody who comes through. So the option could be pump more and more and more money into the hospitals. But is that a real solution? There are, when you reflect back on it, yes, let's keep um, all our hospitals up to um, a particular standard. Make, let's make sure we get as many doctors and nurses there to support that mechanism. But there are other things that we can approach with. So prevention, keeping active, encouraging people to be active, encouraging people to be out, uh, um, keeping, keeping exercised. This is a difficult one, it's, it's always a difficult one, but keeping them active. Transportation, 
Transportation is a good one. Electric cars, scooters, making these more accessible, making these so that a lot more people can get around. Those who have some mobility issues, let them get more access to them, allow them to be more mobile. Some arguments would say, well, is there a scrutiny to what would be an electric car and electric scooter? Do they have to be, do they have to struggle in a particular way? It becomes a real open debate, but um, the, the biggest thing is, is to keep people social. So when you think about um, the people who've had to come out of the labor working market, if they do suffer with mobility, they will want to be social. And being able to get that ability to be able to communicate and be able to move around and actually socialize within groups is a key factor. Nutrition, diet, eating the right thing. I know we've all heard this in school, we hear this on the TV, but the amount of people who genuinely listen to this can be open to the debate. A lot of people won't listen to this. A lot of people will hear it tell themselves, it's okay, tomorrow I'm going to start. I won't lie, I've had a million and one of them days where you just say, right, I'm going to eat this, but tomorrow I'll start. What this is really about, though, is really in listening and really uh, pushing that education as much as possible. So when we consider education, don't leave it too late. Put the education to schools, put it into colleges, encourage as much as possible and try to get people to stay active, to um, let them really understand what is the best way to maintain good health. Because as we all know, there's many. I mean, the issue is, is I, for example, I, I, I go to the gym. At the gym, I listen to some of the trainers, some of their um, uh, input that they give, such good ideas, and they're really inspiring. But the thing is, is not everybody would listen. So you can't exactly just try and throw all the input into one thing and expect it to be fixed because it's not that simple. Communities, social enterprises. Now, communities and social enterprises, these, for me, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, but um, during the COVID lockdown period, the amount of people setting up uh, Facebook groups, the amount of people using um, as much initiative as possible to ensure that people who, who are vulnerable in their communities are supported. This, as, as, as a reflection to the public, as to the people, was really, really promising. It's such phenomenal how people behaved and how people really helped each other. But when you think about this for aging the population, when you think about people who, who again, I'm, I relate back to the people from the work in the labor market, they would need a reason to come out. So why not put money into communities? Why not put it into social enterprises to help them come out, come out of their shell, get them out, out and about? Because this does not just affect those who are uh, physical. This is almost also about the mental. So the mental state, or uh, mental, health, mental health, sorry, um, with people with loneliness or people with, uh, who suffer with any types of depressions, anything like that. What this would do is it would try and encourage people to get out and to be able to see uh, the rest of the world, in a lack of better words. And then finally, technology, software, and hardware. Now, this is one big realization that I personally sat down and thought, yeah, I'd never even thought about that. Nearly all of these, not all of them, so when I consider transport and I consider technology, they are all for the abled body. They're all based on the idea of that there is some there. But what if you have somebody who suffers with um, muscular degenerative diseases? Or um, I, I, what about them in particular? So what I'm going to center on today is particular technologies. Technologies, software, hardware. Now, um, Many different work out there at the moment to try and help people be mobile, be uh, in, even increase on confidence. This has big implications for a lot of people, but what I'm going to center on today is exoskeleton technology. So anybody, for anybody who's unaware of exoskeleton technology, um, the exoskeleton is, exoskeletons themselves are actually described as being a support external exosystem 
for um, any animal or body that it's attached to. Now that's typical to what the, the, the um, description actually has itself defined as. So a bit of a brief history as, as to where these originally came from and where the first ones came from. So in 1960, nicknamed The Handyman, um, funded purely by General Electric, Dr. John Main started to study the use, uh, well, he, started, he proposed an idea, I should say, of an exoskeleton technology, which was purely focused on the shop floor. This was the first registered um, machine which would exercise limbs. I say exercise, I should say actuate limbs. And it would assist that motion. So, for example, what he was aiming to do is to try and minimize the level of people on the shop floor. He was aiming to create, if you will, he was aiming to try and turn a, a person into like a forklift truck, if you will. This would, um, in his theory, would promote uh, productivity and make them more productive. It would also make them a little bit less vulnerable to uh, failures of the human body in itself. Granted, his approach was very ambitious, 1960, but the handyman, as I'm told, is actually still, um, you can actually still go see it at the Ford Museum in the States. Um, the technology itself was too cumbersome. When it ran, it ran for 15 minutes and then broke down. But the idea, is, the idea from what he was taking was genius. The idea of which way he was going was a fantastic idea. In my mind, uh, John Mayne's work was leaps and bounds ahead of where he, he was born too, too long ago, should I say. Born way too for the future. And um, the other thing to keep in mind is this is the first motorized exoskeleton system. So you can actually look back a little bit further and, and find lever systems, which uh, some, uh, some, some German um, uh, designers actually came up with. They're a very, very basic system, but arguably probably one of the first passive exoskeleton systems that you can find. But this, this, uh, but John's is a, is a key marker for me. Then we slingshot forward a little bit to, um, well, quite a bit to 97, when the human assisted limb, how created by, uh, you'll have to forgive me for my pronunciation, but uh, Yoshikuya Sanka, he, um, he introduced a real game changer in exoskeleton technology. He was proposing a system that would not, I should point out, we're not building Iron Man. Um, I listened to that one an awful lot. What he was proposing is he was proposing something that would aid in the assistance. So he was looking at um, some, of the, some of the elderly who were fixed in wheelchairs, who had very little muscle density, and he was aiming to try and offer some mobility back. Now, granted, the power unit on this, again, was the biggest issue, and the output of this was, um, it, it, again, it would only run for around 20 minutes. But one thing he did do is, for the control system, he was looking at using uh, electromyography, so EMG, and granted, in the, in, in the 90s, the late 90s, the controller, the controller of it was still very much in development, but it was a big step in the right direction. It was a big step in looking at using human muscular systems to enable the body to move. When we get to 2010, Berkeley. Now, Berkeley Bionics, if anybody uh, is interested in exoskeleton developments, um, Berkeley, they've done quite a bit looking at uh, passive exoskeletons right through to assistive exoskeletons. Some of their stuff's really great. Now, they did a big game changer. They introduced um, the uh, E-Legs. Now, at the time, it wasn't called the E-Legs. It was called something else. And this system is based on the idea of what they call impedance control. So, in essence, it's similar to a, a, a PID controller where in essence you'll lean the body forwards, almost like a human segue, in a lack of better words. And granted their controller was a little bit all over the place, and since then there's been more of cycle control put into it. So it can commit, this, this thing can allow anybody who is, uh, who's a, who is a paraplegic 
and then the, the mobility to actually stand up out of their chair which I don't know if you've ever seen this demonstration run when when this technology runs it is very very impressive it can almost bring tears to your eyes <clears throat> so we moved to 2017 and uh, Ford unveiled the, what they call the the exo vest or the exo vest this is a passive exoskeleton system this is one of the one of the very early ones that really ends up on the shop floor um you must have seen this around somewhere now this is there's a there's a cracking piece of pr that was done by ford showing one of their workers working on one of their mustangs where he's supporting a lot of weight on his hands and it's passing through now if you look at the actual design there's actually no uh, automated systems on it. This is purely mechanically focused. So as his body rises, it will actually use the center of gravity to pass that down to a different point where the load is no longer being, uh, where the load's been moved, I should say. What it does is it removes the strain from the shoulders, it removes the strain from the laterals, and um, it allows that person to almost feel like weightless, if you will where they're not using a lot of strength on it. I mean, uh, one of the most common examples that you'll physically experience is, well, I mean, not everybody, but um, if you're ever papering, if you're ever decorating your house and you paper the ceiling, you put your arms up and then your arms are up on the ceiling and then you've got to hold that paper there. Instantly, you'll start to feel a uh, strain coming the lats, the laterals. You'll feel it on the deltoids. Then you'll feel it around the back of where the tricep is. And it, then it will really start to hurt. Now, the idea of the XO vest is it will remove that aspect. It will take that support and it'll allow you to be sustained in that position for much longer. Um, then we move to 2018. Now, this is the robotic spine exoskeleton um, produced by Columbia University. And the rows, for short, uh, was a real game changer. Now, the one thing that I don't know who noticed this, but uh, the one thing that noticed that, that uh, is clearly there is that all the former exoskeletons were based on the idea of moving entirety of limbs, moving the entire body and make and uh, almost flexing that body. Now, the rose, the rose exoskeleton introduced a different idea. Could you actuate the body around its key point of motion, not just driving it and, and almost, if you will, the exoskeleton moving the body, but not considering what the body is actually attempting to do, creating flexibility in a lack of better words. Now, the rose is um, obviously a prototype exoskeleton. It is, it is focused purely on support of people with spinal problems. Um, the one thing that's really key with exoskeletons now is the development for um, assisted assistance in the medical world. It's a large area of development, and especially with uh, the ASTM, is, is a huge area of, that is being considered. <clears throat> so, sorry, that took a moment then. Um, so, our exoskeleton project. Now, I nicknamed it the Exo Move to some of the rest of the team. It bugs them to death because it's a name that just doesn't make sense. We've renamed it since then, but I put it on there just because it's um, it's a bit of fun on, on top of all the, the seriousness that we've been doing. So what we did is we were, we were focusing on a simple motion. I say simple motion, but don't think for one second that the human body is anything more than the one of the most complicated systems in the world. We were looking at the sitting up motion. So um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to consider a person and how their body moves. So what we did is we, can, we took the overall um, autonomy of the body and we started looking at the back. Now, all we were doing is looking at the sitting motion. Now, the sitting motion, as much as um, we all take it for granted, I always take it for granted, we all take it for granted. It's actually a very, very complicated process. In that complication of the process, what we've decided to do is try to um, 
simplify as much as we could to try and get realistic representation. So we um, took the body and then we identified key points. Uh, apologies, my markers have just dropped off the sign a little bit there, but we identified these key points. We identified where the, lateral, the, the lats would sit, we identified the uh, trapezoids and the deltoids, and what we essentially did is marked out, because we knew these muscles were being triggered to allow us to sit up. And we wanted to keep this as, as simple as possible because some of the whirlwind that we hit when we were going through this was phenomenal. Um, what we did is we thought, right, we're going to try and use a continuum-based system. The continuum idea is the idea of that if um, we're looking at a variant person. So if we're talking at somebody like my height, for example, I'm six foot five. Um, if, but if we're talking about somebody who's uh, five foot four, could we still support between the two? Now, with a continuum idea, what we're able to do is where we have the small segments, these segments can be removed and we can actually scale it to where it needs to sit. Um, where these key points are actually noted, what we knew with that is we wanted to drive it. So where the markers are here, where the red, red, I've not clearly marked that, apologies, where the red lines are for it, we're actually talking these points are where its, it's actuation would be. And from there, once we've done that, we are, were able to identify on our skeletal system where the laterals would be taken into consideration, where linear actuators would be placed, where the trapezoids would be taken into consideration, and also the deltoids where we were actually trying to exert force upon it to actually make it move. We were looking at these and we decided that uh, linear actuators would be able to support what we wanted to, but rather than running in feed first, we wanted to commit to a study. So, the mortar system. Looking at, now the references are beneath from two key um, uh, pieces, of study, pieces of research that were completed, uh, samples of 100 children. Now what we really wanted to do is we wanted to really centre our, our attentions onto children. Now this was purely because um, a lot of the exoskeletons that we've seen so far, they're extremely expensive. So a standard exoskeleton can uh, come back in the region of thirty to 40,000 and sometimes in even higher. However, when it comes to children, because children grow, because children can grow quickly, what this meant is uh, a lot of exoskeletons do not exist for children. And also, um, I think the only, I've only, in my research, I've only ever been able to find one particular exoskeleton that is still under research and development. But again, this is a solid base structure, and once children outgrow it, it has to be removed. But I'll, rec I'll cover that a little bit more soon. So within these data sets that were done, um, on the different heights, 20 newtons to 80 newtons were uh, measured for the trapezoids, and the deltoids between uh, 39 to 160, and the lats became much higher, as you can see. Um, Part of these were needing to be calculated because there was some discrepancy between these two data sets. So we went back to um, the human body and mechanics, which I'm going to uh, um, complement in just a second. The linear actuators that we chosen, these were off the shelf linear actuators. Each can deliver 80 Newtons uh, for the lower sides. The smaller ones uh, would support 42 Newtons by themselves. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure that a lot of young people in the audience will kind of sit there and go, well, yeah, that's very good. But for, for me, when I looked at that, I thought, my God, that is a lot of force that these things can deliver. It's amazing these, uh, these newer, these newer uh, actuators, the newer motors, their ability and what they can actually do. Um, so yes, as you can see, actually on the drawing to the right, we've got um, uh, linear actuators in pairs actually up the back linear actuators between where the deltoids sit and also where the traps are actually supporting around the head. So this was purely just to look at that. <clears throat> so 
Right, now there is uh, bigger discussions with this. When we first started to look at this, what we discussed is um, how should we make this? How should this be done? Now, um, I should really show um, some good appreciation to one of the attendees who was also involved in this. Um, there was a team of three of us who originally started just discussing this. Um, we debated on the idea of uh, producing these components from an aluminium structure. Now, when we looked at the price, <laughs> you can imagine the price that we were looking at way too much. So we sat back and thought. Now, when I sat with uh, a colleague, uh, one of the team we'll introduce, um, we realized, could we use 3D printed materials? What about poly polylactic acid? Off the shelf, PLA polylactic acid. Did it hold any types of uh, potential to actually support us a little bit further in what we were trying to do? Um, it was very exciting at the time. And again, one thing we were focusing on the, the child's body, so a lower, so less mass. So we were confident that we had something that was special. We were confident that we had something that was quite good for the support. Now, I should just point out on the drive of this. If you look on the right, you can see what looks to be like a, a pan. This is our motor conversion system. Now, uh, at the top, you have the motor fixing. This is where the linear actuator would interface. Now, one thing that we identified very early is if we trigger a linear actuator that's running in parallel to the body, what the actuator will do is actually try and push into the body and in the end, possibly damage or tear the muscle far worse than when it originally started. So what we realized is we were trying to create a moment around it. So you'll notice at the bottom, we have a bush. The bush interfaces to the segments these segments will then um, create that moment to almost think of it like this. If someone pushes their finger into your back, you feel it pushing into the muscle. However, the way that we design this is because it creates that moment around the, the bush uh, from the actuator, it ends up like a helping hand. So think of it like that, where the, the back of it will actually push into the back, almost supporting it, assisting that motion. And that was a key element that we wanted to make sure that we got. Um, also, at the beginning, we were a little bit, well, we were a little bit nervous about what we're calling the motor housing. We thought the level of force traveling through that, we could be looking at instant failure, so we decided to go with a PET carbon, um, a PETC, so that's obviously the polyurethane uh, <laughs> thermal, thermal plated with carbon, and that became um, the, the assembly for that. In the main units themselves, the main segments themselves, all segments were produced using PLA. And um, in between all this, we actually have nitrile acting as um, an elastic spine, if you will, a spinal cord, as we called it. This, uh, this, in theory, would allow us to create a tilt, a twist, and also a move forward. So, we, we really didn't want to lose focus on the idea of sitting up. That's the idea. So, into study one. What we knew is we needed to be sure about how well this had functioned. Now, there are two studies in this. Again, on the uh, contents, I missed to put on uh, study two. But study one was looking at the neck. Now, as I said at the start, the human body is incredibly sophisticated. What we decided to do is go back to the anatomy of human movement. Um, if nobody's actually seen this, by the way, and you want um, mechanical engineering and you want to get a good feel of the human body in motion, phenomenal book. I just, just wanted to just point that out. What we decided to do is use on a head based roughly around the size of four kilos. It's for a child, it is actually slightly on the larger side, and um, it can come in at around 3.8 to 4 kilos around the head size. That, again, is an average. So if you end up going home and weighing your head, apologies if yours is even lighter, but this was an average that was taken. Now, you'll notice on the drawing that what we were actually doing is we've turned this into a class one lever system. Um, again, rather than just rushing 
rushing feet first into things. We wanted to be sure that the equations that we're using are, do have some credibility to them. Credibility to them. So um, we went down the road of using the class one lever system, um, and where the CG sits. Now the, the center of gravity sits closer to the front of the head, just to where the jaw sits and everything like that. So um, what we've done is we calculated out again, giving us uh, an assistance of 20 newtons um, of an output. <clears throat> So the modeling work that we've moved to. Now, um, there we go, frozen. So uh, we've passed this through to Comsol Multiphysics. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of this software, if anybody's um, unsure about this. Um, what we did is we I, I built these systems in Comsol. I passed the connector through and simulated the connector's performance based on values that I pulled straight from um, the um, material selector, the Cambridge material selector, and looked, mapping them against what was offered by Ultimaker, who were the, produ the producers of the materials that we were using. Um, then ran my uh, values, be it my 80 newtons for the neck or the larger, um, uh, no, 40 newtons for the neck and the 80 newtons for the larger ones. Now, because I knew this was going to be constant, all I knew I needed to do is look at where the bush was interfacing with the uh, segments themselves, then using the multiphysics aspect, very similar to ANSYS, if anybody's uh, unsure, I was then able to pass this through to the skeletal system itself. Then from there, um, I was able to run that looking at variant head assistance. Now, what I mean by that is, if I just slip onto the next slide, you'll notice that we've got all these different outputs. What we decided to do is to see how well this material would perform. I mean, on reflection now, we look back and go, well, perhaps we didn't need to. Um, but, but what we decided to do was run it in two separate states, two newtons of force, would be gradual assistance on the head. I should point out, we are not studying um, the effect of assistance on para paraplegics, only because um, that is a whole new level of complication in this problem. Um, yeah, we studied resistance force at two newtons, at, again, assuming that the muscle assistance in this was very little. And then we studied the effect at 20 newtons, which was in, in which was implying that there was no support of the head at all, just to see for this study work, just to see how well the PLA will perform. Because our real focus on this was to purely look at how well the PLA would perform. Now, it's fairly of a, a four times 10 to the power of seven. In relative to the forces that we were getting out, we were very excited, very, very excited. I mean, um, when this first came out and we realized that, um, I'll, I'll be honest, when we realized that uh, polylactic acid could do so much more of a better job than what we thought, this was a very exciting moment for us because we realized that what we had is the potential of being able to develop exoskeleton technology as a solid structured exoskeleton technology to support children of the ages of of well four upwards until the ages of 13 at least but then when, once we really looked at the forces that were outputting we realized that there was a lot of leadway left in this in this behavior looking at the forces it was it was telling us it was going to do it offered the opportunity of this might not just be for children this might be for adults we might have an option here where the system that we're using can be bigger than what we thought. It can be massive in what we thought. Apologies, I get very, very excited about this, this project, so I'm trying to hold it in a little bit. Um, but when we looked at the, P, uh, uh, the, the PET C, <laughs> yeah, the PET C was well outside. Um, we kind of thought, right, okay, okay, then we can perhaps go back to the connector and actually examine the idea of what if the, the uh, connector was not entirely PET-C, 
because pet C as a material is actually quite expensive. You, if you consider this as a retail value off the, off the shelf, your standard PLA may set you back, if it's for multi-maker, it may set you back around £20. The pet C may set you back up to the excess of £60. And this is under a one kilo example, but when you consider that on a mass production element, if we're considering this to offer this for people to be able to maintain, rebuild and recreate uh, components to help somebody who's needing mobility, it needs to be accessible, it needs to be cheap and it needs to be working. And this got us extremely excited. However, this is just a simulation. We needed validation. When we got into study one, um, uh, my colleague, uh, we were looking at, we actually made a controller and um, what we decided to do was rebuild it. Now, if anybody's curious, yes, that is an Arduino Uno that I am using to actually uh, actuate the controller. I've <coughs> Apologies. Um, what this was set to is, let me just bring on these tabs. The linear actuator was set to cycle at a maximum extension and then retract to its minimum extension. This was then cycled solid for 15 minutes and an average was continuously taken to take a look at what it was getting. They were also uh, anchored uh, to the top by two Newtons. Simply, I had anchored to the front and then this was just resisting trying to recreate my initial two Newton output that I was discussing. Now this got us very excited. This is the output that we found. And I know what you'll all be thinking. Well, that's not very good. Look at the difference. Now I've done that in particular just to be annoying. Well, not to be annoying, just to make, just to really open your eyes to something. It's in meters, but we're in microns that that's operating. So this then got us very excited. We kind of sat there and thought, okay, what's one provisional thing that this could be doing? Why could it be doing that? Why could it be doing, why could it be giving us such an offset? Then the penny dropped. I, when I built the, um, the console model, when I built this model into, um, into the simulation package, what it is presuming is that the interboundary layers of connection is perfect. Now, for anybody who's unsure of interboundary layers, if you think of a 3D print, layer is created, then you have a second layer created, and a third layer. These layers, as they're interfacing, will never um, bond perfectly. Now, that can lead to inconsistencies. Now, what we propose and what we, we do believe is that this could be a reflection of us neglecting that interboundary layer and also the mechanical database that we pulled straight from uh, what is offered by the manufacturers of uh, the polylactic acid is very limited. The input to it is very limited. We uh, firmly believe that a further investigation to refine the understanding of it uh, needs to be done. If you actually look into quite a few research papers at the moment, you will find a lot of people that have been looking at laminate theory and looking at um, modeling these to try and get a more consistent approach to uh, the mechanical database. Okay, so we're excited with that. We knew that we we got something. Then it went a bit wrong. <laughs> I'm kidding. So um, we then, went back to the same principle again, and what we decided to do is have the uh, body sitting up. Now again, I can feel, I'm, I'm sure a few of you will be thinking, oh, well, that's just, that's surely just a giant lever. It is really just a giant lever. But what we were looking to try and do is to figure out where the forces, what level of forces were being applied. And then by transposing these onto vectors, we could actually apply these along the spine to actually look at how well this spine, spine will perform as it's operating. Um, when we ran into it, uh, the, 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 the big issue with this, ah, I've just realized that's, that's just reintroducing the, the key points within it. Now I should point out here, 
where you'll notice on here now that the neck section is missing. We drew a line underneath that because we wanted to focus on the mobility and how, um, how effective this exoskeleton system would be. Um, it has opened up quite a few doors for us. So repeating the same process again. Um, in this case now, we did have to do hyperelasticity. So we had to model the nitrile to show how elasticated it was and how well this would perform overall and how this would respond overall. The segments, um, what we decided to do is separate them into two sections. The lower segments and the upper segments. Apologies on the slide before, I thought I'd put the segment breakdown onto it so you could be aware. Um, now what we've noticed is, if you can see there, the two blue segments are the key points where the actuators are interfacing to the actual body. Now you notice beneath that there is a passive response coming from these. Um, they rise to the highest of three newton meters squared. So the dissipation of this force is quite good and we were quite happy with what it was doing. So the PLA as a structure was doing its job. We were very excited about it. Um, when we got, when we come down, however, what one of the team members realized is if we take a mean of the upper segments and the lower segments, it should tell us a few things. It should tell us how well force is distributed as it's actually rising from the lying position to the sitting position. And if you see there, the bottom segments um, for the standard deviation, it's quite big. On the upper segments, they're not. So what it's actually suggesting is that when the person is coming to sit up, the lower segments don't dissipate force too well. There's quite a lot of passive things going on. And also, when you have a passive system in such a way, and if we're talking about a very, um, let's say, limp body, what this actually means is you're almost going to get shaking where the body can twist. This was not the most ideal output that we were looking for. It did make us realize on a few important aspects, though. If you consider the mean, you look at the bottom segment, um, sorry, I've actually got them two wrong way around. So the standard deviation on the upper and the lower, yes. So I, I've just realized that, apologies. So on the mean, you can see there that the lower segment's uh, distribution is quite high. We, um, it wasn't the most ideal solution that we were looking for. We were hoping that this would give a lot more of, a, of an approach to support. However, um, this has led to some important conclusions that we feel. So when we consider the conclusions that we found, we knew that PLA, we know that PLA um, can't even replace some of conventional metals in this, and it's, it's far exceeded anything that we expected. We know that this will support bodies, this will support on a larger, let's say trunks, I should say trunk, um, anybody who, who recognizes the upper body as being a different name, apologies, it's, it's one that we've been using. So we know that the, the trunk can be supported by uh, use of polylactic acid. We know that um, it's, it's, it's performance, it's really exciting really just because this as an accessibility opens up real windows for a lot of development. This offers the idea of that if 3D printing has such an input that it can support people for the future, what it will allow is it will allow people to have accessibility. It means things like uh, the NHS. Now I should point out the NHS and Ultimaker now have a formal contract where uh, Ultimaker do supply all their printers to the NHS. And that, that printer in particular is the one that we've been using to um, prototype some of our equipment that we've made so far. Um, the other conclusion with this that we found, by if we're gonna consider this, we can drop price by this of a factor of 10. It means any low income family, if they have a child who's uh, struggling in mobility, has very little option as far as being able to get out and being able to enjoy a good productive life. It means this type of technology can change that. This is the pure game changer as far as 
uh, children living a normal and interactive life. And I say children, but from some of our findings, we honestly do feel that we can also support the adult body as well. So, further work. Um, there is something I do need to point out. Some of the developments that we've made, we realized it didn't work. We knew, and we now know, that it, it, um, the, the system itself, the big findings for us is about the polylactic acid. We know that um, we needed to change direction. So uh, I should, this makes it sound very worse than what it is, but secretly at the university, we have been developing what we're, what we're nicknaming the second generation. Um, we're very excited about this. We've improved on everything that we found that was uh, not key to what, we've, what we've, I've just been presenting. We do firmly believe that um, we've still been able to keep price of development of this technology at a low. Um, and we do think that this will be a huge game changer. The, uh, what I should say is this, well, I, what, what I can tell you about this is this is going to be a hybrid approach which will be part solid to fabric structure. Um, I can't tell you much more than that because at present it is wrapped up in uh, non-disclosure agreements and we are looking to try and keep this completely silent at the moment because we do feel that this has a big implication for the future. Right, so where do we need to go now? And I'm sure a few of you have been sat there going, yeah, but polylactic acid, it can soak in um, um, uh, bacteria. Absolutely true. If any of you have been on any types of 3D printing forums, you'll listen to people tell you, um, do not use polylactic acid for food. This is one of the reasons. It can actually draw that material, it can actually draw bacteria into it, and it can lead to further problems. Now, if you consider polylactic acid against the human body, as you sweat, because let's face it, we all sweat, that sweat drains onto the polylactic acid of PLA, and then the bacteria will soak to it. That, if you're then putting this back on there, you can guarantee that the skin will end up with sores, infection, and often make that person more ill than what they presently are. So what, um, what we want to now do is look at the use of antimicrobial resistant PLA. Luckily, we've made some very nice friends at Ultimaker who put, in, put us in touch with the lead manufacturer of what's called copper polylactic acid. Now, um, with this material, it has copper, a nanocopper actually in the PLA, and um, what, it's, what it's originally been designed for is coatings. The idea of this is to actually, so let's say we have a handle, we produce a component and it coats around it, and once it's done, snap it off and put a new one on. But the idea of putting copper in there, it will resist that, uh, um, the bacteria and actually stop it from settling in. Apologies if I'm not doing that any justice. I am not a um, microbes uh, expert. Um, this is just me listening to a, a colleague who's been filling me in all about it. However, the issue with this material is it's never been properly formally tested for mechanical structures. So what we need to do is consider about that. What's it going to do? Is it going to help? Is it going to be rubbish? Is it a way forwards? For us, we need to know. The, the issue is, is, as everybody knows who's in the room, when you combine an, another material with another, you can actually get changes in mechanical behavior. We cannot compromise um, the idea of moving forwards. We need to consider this very wisely. The next thing, um, the mechanical material testing data. As I, as I talked about earlier, some of the findings that we've got, we're excited about them, uh, about the uh, simulated and the physical test of results. However, we still want to know about that mechanical data. Now, there are research papers out there that support a lot of the things that we wanted to look at, but we've found a particular area gap in the research that we want to just study that a little bit more and it's the, dis and it's the discussion of more, um, as they say, hybrid printed approach. So this will be a composite print. 
but looking at different interfacing that way. So lots of things going on, very exciting. And then finally, the one thing that I didn't talk about is the human to machine interface. Um, what we've discovered is some phenomenal things. Um, what we'll be looking at is we have now started looking at linear discriminant analysis to characterize moments, motions from humans. And we're looking at the uh, central pattern generator for locomotion. And what we're essentially trying to do is look at that central pattern generator for locomotion and can we feed that back into the exoskeleton? Because if we can, we can aid not only in somebody's mobility, but also we can also aid in uh, the retraining of people after a stroke. Again, this is still very early fundamental discussions, so it's, it's very early doors towards that. But this is where it's moving. This is where we've been moving. And this is uh, where our focus lies at the moment. Um, collaborations. I cannot do this presentation at all without uh, talking about some of these amazing people that have been there at the moment. Um, the, the actual originator of this project, I'll discuss in a minute, but since the end of what we are calling first generation, um, Professor Jim Richards, University of Central Lancashire, biomechanics, he has been, him and his team, in particular, Ambring Trogel, she and him have been extremely supportive towards uh, the next generation. He's helped us in um, key points, making sure our key points are even closer. Because one thing that we realized is our key points for actuation, we were still slightly out since then. Um, I mean, I've not even had time to even put the others onto here. So I've been in correspondence with Stanford University and they've been able to guide us a little bit more on um, the use of open sim. What this allows us to do is to consider each muscle in motion and um, between Jim and Anne Brain, we've been really being really supportive. Uh, Karen May is sports re rehabilitation. Karen's specialism, what she really brought to the table for us is she knows about EMS, electro, uh, electrical muscul muscular stimulation, apologies. And uh, Karen's input towards this, some of her uh, ideas have been phenomenal. And we cannot forget the, one of the great inputs from the university as well, who is Louise Ann Connell. Um, she's a neuro rehabilitations professor. She goes out all over um, the Northwest, uh, helping practitioners, helping the assistants. I should point out, what we're suggesting is not the replacement of a practitioner, because I don't know if any of you have ever seen um, some of these nurses when they're actually doing what they do, a phenomenal work that they do. And so this is not about doing that. This is about assisting their work and helping them in the process. Uh, Ultimaker. Now, originally they loaned us the machine. Now we own the machine. Um, we have still got a strong contact with Ultimaker and Ultimaker have been incredibly supportive in, in the point of putting us in touch with materials manufacturers. Um, I should point out this project started very early with absolutely very little um, amount of um, backing for it. To take it where we've taken it in a shocking 14 months is, uh, we're really proud of it. Um, Tinius Olsen, they have seen the project and they are a world leader in materials testing. Uh, they, have <laughs> they have very nicely uh, launders for the project. Now, Sean, Sean Bird, who's actually technical director for the American Tinius Olsen, he has said that we are being loaned the machine until the project's over. So he said if that's one year or in 15 years, look after the machine. And um, they have now become a partner on this project, which has been very exciting to meet them and also uh, Sean from that team. Mike Mead is my contact from Ultimaker. Again, really good guy. And Sean Bird from uh, ASTM, who has been my anchor as far as getting key members from MIT and uh, Stanford University to actually who to speak to. And finally, the team. The team at present, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Matt Stables. He has been working with me on keeping a bit of focus, where we're going, 
what's the direction, making sure, because I don't know if any of you can tell, but I can go completely off stream sometimes with this. I get very excited about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, Dr. Steve, Steven Sigurdian, he said Steve Sigurdian, Dr. Steven Sigurdian, um, he has taken pure lead on the control side. He is one of the, the best robotics engineers I think I've ever met. And um, when it comes to proposing different control systems, I can often say to Steve, what do you think of this? And 90% of the time, he's actually completed that task already. A phenomenal guy to work with. And um, Ed Sanderson, he was part of the original team. Now, I should give a shout out because um, there was one extra person, um, Morgan Jenkinson. She and Ian uh, and uh, Ed Sanderson, they were with me working from the start. Morgan, since then, has flown, flown from the university and now studying a PhD in her own specialism. This project, though, is still very much alive. And Ed is the guy where we discussed about the 3D printed material. We bounced these ideas backwards and forwards. And yes, he is presently a PhD student. And he's also um, an active member of staff, I should say. And then finally, we have a PhD student starting. <laughs> I chose this picture just because uh, Dominic will hate me for showing that picture. But he is um, a very gifted uh, engineer. And then finally, a true honorary member of the team, and still to this day, is Christina. Now, let me just explain Christina. So, now, I'm very, very... I'm, personally, I'm very quite passionate to make sure that no matter what we do, we never forget uh, where these ideas came from. Christina, at the age of... Oh, I get this wrong every time, but at the age of nearly 15 years old, was a part of the Primary Engineer Initiative. She entered the competition, and her cousin s suffers with um, a particular muscular disease. All she actually said is, why can there not be a jacket that children can wear that will help them move? And I, I won't lie, I've done these types of projects in outreach for years and I kind of thought there must be millions of these out there if you do get chance after this just have a look there is not much out there that supports the rehabilitation for children don't get me wrong I'm not saying nobody wants to develop it because there is a lot of people doing all sorts to support children but Christina's idea the way that she's written it and her approach towards it she really I cannot take responsibility for the ideas of what she had. We then captured her idea, and granted, between her drawing and how it ended up is quite a bit different. But we then captured her idea, and um, we realized that she'd really found something special. She'd, real, she'd noticed something which was amazing. Since then, I've um, been in, I stay in contact with Christina, and I bring in her family quite a bit to discuss this, because um, this youngster really cares an awful lot. So much so that after this, she applied for a scholarship in nursing. And now, last time I spoke to her, she's just finishing her A-levels to go into rehabilitation nursing. Um, I, <laughs> I literally said to her that um, if that nursing lot doesn't work out, you'll be a hell of an engineer for the future. So I really wanted to just give Christina the acknowledgement and uh, for the first team we worked on it, uh, Ed, Morgan, and Christina, what we completed in at the time was nine months. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. And then since then, in the rest of the 14 months that's there, um, oh, it was a little bit more. Yeah, 14 months that was there. Um, we've been able to really test this. Granted, we found that our initial design is flawed. It's a shame, but we realized that um, some of the big hits for this really influenced where our decisions going in the future. And finally, um, I should point out, um, I'd like to give a, a good call out to the MedTech Development Group. Um, this has been a response from um, the University of Central Lancashire after the COVID hit. You may or may not have seen on the news some of the components that us as a team 
we responded to with masks, with viral adapters, with and all types of different types of brackets. And um, we realized as a team, as a group, that we can respond extremely well. And since then, this team in particular has uh, assisted me in making sure that I'm supported as far as developing some of my contacts with the ASTM. Um, this group is thriving. And the other thing I should point out, if you do feel that um, there is something that you as a professional can introduce or offer to the group, you're more than welcome to attend the meetings and even uh, become, become one of us. Uh, because this is a, a forever developing group and these are the key people I've been working with at the moment. Finally, what I really like to close in a presentation, I don't like to finish with, thanks, are there any questions? I like to finish with a summary of what we've been doing. So thinking about the aging population is not just a one, is not just solved with one solution. Now, when I first saw this, I, I, I'll reiterate what I said. When I, when I first saw this, I thought, I don't really know what you mean. I mean, is it a big impact? It is a huge thing. These solutions are not just solved in one single hit. The user of whatever you're designing must drive the design cycle. Now, what I mean by that is if you look at that design and you really look at it, you'll realize that what we did is we did not do that. We did not, you, we did not take the user to, do, to drive that design cycle. We found some amazing things with it and some very exciting elements to it that got us, and that still keeps me super excited. But the project itself has grown, and it's grown in a direction that I wish I could tell you all about. I really do. Um, costs must be considered when technology is being developed. One of the most important things about offering new technologies to the world is making sure the world can afford it. The truth of it is, is some low-income families would never get access to particular technologies. However, if you can create a technology of a good price that works, that is maintainable, not just by the health practitioner, but also by the families, then you've cracked it. What you've actually done is you've produced a technology that any low-income family can support their, their loved ones or support their children. Not saying that they're not loved ones, but uh, or support their children and really, really um, change their living life. And finally, 3D printed materials offer an adequate solution to many medical use technologies. Now, um, conventional materials could be um, all different types of hard based structures, so aluminium, steel, things like that. But what I'm saying is that not when we replace it completely, what I'm saying is that the 3D printed material can be an active component we can consider but rather than thinking about the manufacturer making these all the time think about how families could remake certain things rebuild certain things make your designs accessible maintainable and usable thank you thank you very much matt um I'm sure if this was live, this would probably be the point where you get a round of applause, um, but it's just me. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone who's turned up. I would just like to point out on the uh, the WorkCast platform that you're currently viewing this from, there is the Ask a Question, Ask a Question button. If anyone would like to submit questions for Matt now, uh, you can submit them via that, and I'll be able to read them out and we'll discuss them. There is one waiting in the inbox already, Matt, if you're ready for some questions. Yeah, fire away whenever you're ready. Fantastic. So we have a question from Chloe, who's a physiotherapy student. Uh, she was just wondering about the sitting up of the exoskeleton. When you said you designed it around sitting up, do you maintain? Do you mean maintaining a sitting position or the action of going between lying and sitting? <laughs> yeah. I won't like. Um, I had this discussion with somebody recently, and they asked me the exact same question. Yes, I'm not saying the, the maintaining. I'm saying the rise. So it's it's moving from the lying position, moving towards that sitting motion, and just looking at the forces distributing throughout the skeletal structure as that uh, action is occurring. 
Fantastic. I hope that answers the question. Um, if anybody else has any questions, uh, now is the time to pop them in. Um, I'll just give the audience a moment. I appreciate normally on a live uh, in-person meeting, we'd be able to just raise our hands and shout them out. So if anyone's busy typing, I don't want to cut you off too soon. I know it's very strange, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Okay, well, I'm just waiting to see if there's any more uh, questions coming through on the inbox. Um, if you don't have a question right now, but you have one later at the time, um, you can always get in contact with us at a later date. You can submit it to myself via the IMECI near you site that a lot of people have signed up on. Oh, we've got another question in the inbox. Oh, as well as a comment saying thank you from Chloe. Um, so um, we've got a question from Barry at FDS. Your mention of EMS um, is interesting, but did not form part of the work uh, that you've described on this particular exoskeleton. During future development, do you envision using EMS as part of the exoskeleton or as a separate system? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I don't want to diverge too much on this. But let me let me put it this way: um, EMS, as um, as you well know offers an awful lot of potential. Um, on this current work, we have we discussed if we were hypothetically going to put an EMS system where it would sit. Then um, uh, Karen, Karen, this is what I meant by Karen was such a good input because what she was able to do is go, no, don't be daft. It won't sit there. It needs to sit here. And on our new system, what the EMS is, is in, it is integrated in particular key points. Now, granted, EMS and also EMG cannot run together. So um, what this would be is a configurable aspect. That's, a, that's all I can really diverge on that. So it looks like someone's already beginning to catch on to stuff you're not allowed to talk about. Um, I know, I know. Uh, we have another question from Morgan, uh, one of the people who actually worked on the topic originally. Are you still using uh, 12 actuators, or has that changed? <laughs> I only laugh just because, yes, I know, Morgan. Um, no, the uh, actuator system, no, yeah, I'm not going to diverge too much. So let's just say, no, I'm not using the actuator system anymore, us as a team. We've diverged a new system, which is so exciting. I, I'm trying to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got another question here from Harry, which is, what is the estimated cost involved in a full suit? Oh, yeah, for an all, an all body suit, what we predicted is we could produce the entire thing as one hit, including uh, the EMG sensors, for an average around 10,000. With maintenance per component of the maximum of a pound. That's pretty incredible. Um, we have a question from David from DJT Design. What is the power source for the device? Uh, so the approximate power usage, and he assumes the weight of the power source would have been taken into account to calculate the forces needed to move. Yes, the, they were. What we'd essentially done for this is we weren't convinced about the design from the start. I mean, um, as, as the attendee Morgan will know, we sat there and we weren't convinced that uh, how well this would actually function with it. So um, to focus around the skeletal um, structures, what we were using is small lithium ionide batteries that were, that were almost worn in a vest. They when we actually looked at it, it wasn't the most productive way of doing it. And since then, we've actually constructed, best way to describe would be um, a passive belt. Think of it like a bat belt, that where it's a, a, a very solid base structure, but they actually sit in, embedded within there. Fantastic. Um, we have another question from Stephen. Incredible to see the progress this work has taken. I remember your excitement, and it's great to see it's not dampened. 
When do you expect <laughs> to see demos of the system working? Um, this system, the one thing that's really frustrating, I won't lie, is COVID kicked in and study two of the back, we actually have a running back ready to go. And I wanted to, do, I, I like to, like everybody else who's probably sat in this audience, I like to validate. I like to be sure what I'm saying has got genuine uh, points to it. All we could really do was rely on our first initial tests. Physical testing on a human being on our second generation, with some of the findings that we've got, we're, we're that excited that we like to think that we'll be looking at a maximum of two years before we are running on the body. This is taken into consideration COVID restrictions. Uh, we, we do believe that we'll be running on a human in two years. That's an incredible timeline. Um, <laughs> not a submitted question, but one from me personally. Obviously, you mentioned that there's a version two, effectively, of this in the works that you can't disclose. When yeah. that's completed, and or, or at least into a testing phase, will there be still some applications of this current model that we can see, or will this be eclipsed by the second version? I mean, the thing is with our present one, we do believe that it will offer some level of assistance, so it would help. The only issue is is on the findings on the back, on the on the lower of, of, of the core, uh, of the trunk, I should say. Um, we realize that the passive levels in between where the actuators sit is too high, that it wouldn't be very comfortable to wear. Um, we, we, we do keep looking at this to see if there's more uh, places where this could sit more comfortably. But I should really say that the, the next one will quite eclipse this one. And yeah, we'll probably be doing more talks about that one. Fantastic. Is there any prediction of when we'll be able to see more of the next one? At the moment, uh, the actual design is passing through our um, patency offices, and I'm working quite closely with Tinius Olsen. And ideally, in, the, <laughs> in an ideal world, we should see very first forms of this in a year. Fantastic. I'm sure that year can't pass quick enough. Um, I know. <laughs> if there are any other questions people have, um, I'll still keep it open as we close this out. Uh, there are the multiple comments now just saying thank you very much, Matt, from the audience. Um, so I'll, thank I'll you pass coming. those on to you. Yeah. Um, as I say, if you do have any additional questions, you can use the send a message link on the iMeki near you page to pass those on to me. I can forward on any questions to Matthew uh, and send back any replies, vice versa, we can we can talk it over. I'm sure, Matt, you constantly love to talk about this project uh, and wouldn't mind any yeah. other questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, we had a, a, a late one from Lloyd, who just says, what drives your passion for this technology? <laughs> now, I should point that um, originally I wasn't going to get involved in something like this. But then um, I met Christina. Then she told me the story about uh, her cousin. And then I did my own research looking at um, people who suffer with mobility issues. And then I realized that as engineers, what we do is we try to solve problems. And the idea of being able to solve this problem, just I cannot stop thinking about it. And it gets me excited that the idea of that any student who gets involved in this, any person who gets involved in this, will be genuinely looking towards changing someone's living life. And that's what drives me. I think that's a fantastic answer. Uh, we've got another one from Tom, a, a UCLan student. With the maintenance, uh, is, does it require like a routine inspection are you projecting or will it be on a requested basis? Because you've obviously mentioned the sort of costs of maintenance. Yeah, but... yeah. Now, um, uh, best answer I can give you, Tom, is if you look down the back of the spine, you'll notice these tiny discs. These discs have been designed to a failure point. Once that material starts to lose its structural integrity, 
when they start to interface, they will break off. Um, any type of material has its life cycle. Polylactic acid under UV light can suffer quite a bit. So as far as maintenance on the components, there is more work needed to be done. Of course, there is more work needed to be done, but it will need to be checked. I, w I would say, at a guess, every six months to just check it to make sure that the structure is, is still with intact. You will instantly see failures occurring, fatigue, cracking, and uh, breakages occurring. But the beauty is, is it costs nothing to replace it, and it's and it's got the and it's ecologically friendly because of it being polylactic acid. That's my best answer, anyway. Fantastic. That draws the question to a close. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for your contributions, for your questions. Thank you, Matt, again. Thank you very much for, for coming, giving us this talk today. It's been fantastic. I hope everyone's enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, just want to quickly mention, this has obviously been hosted by the South Lancashire Young Members Panel. If you did enjoy this uh, and you would like to see another talk like it, we do have another talk coming up on the 7th of October. That will be taking place at 6 o'clock, and that is Racing Hovercraft Design and Manufacturer by uh, Tony Broad. He's another lecturer at UCLan, uh, and he also has a bit of a history, well, a, quite a big history with hovercraft design and manufacture, so he'll be delivering a talk then. Um, just a bit of promo there for you all. So thank you, every, everyone, thank you everyone very much for attending, and uh, as I say, drop us any questions if you have them via the link, and uh, maybe we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.